is the loneliest place, and what a lonely, and so forth. I don't know about them. I haven't been lonely one minute. <laughs> This is for you and not for no, me. No, you take trouble. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah, I should, okay. Thank you. I'll call you up. Right. Good evening, everyone. My name's John Highbush, and I have the great honor of being the executive director of the Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you all for coming this evening. In honor of our men and women who defend our freedom around the world, if you'd please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, please be seated. Our guest tonight, Craig Shirley, is no stranger to the Reagan Library. And he is certainly no stranger to me, having been a dear friend for years and a fellow foot soldier in the Reagan Revolution that started when we were both kids just, uh, well, a few years ago. <laughs> Neither of us would like to admit we met in the trenches that many years ago, but we have fought together side by side for the conservative cause in the name of Ronald Reagan. And I must say it has always been a joyous fight to be alongside Craig. When I have introduced Craig before, I've often used a title for him that is perfectly fitting and absolutely true. Craig Shirley is, in my mind and in the minds of many, many others, the unofficial, official biographer of Ronald Reagan. And there's no dispute about this. For decades, Craig Shirley, the writer, Craig Shirley, the historian, Craig Shirley, the political consultant, Craig Shirley, the public relations executive, has chronicled the life and times of Ronald Reagan more accurately, more expansively, more authoritatively than any other author in history, living or dead. I'm happy to make that claim while Craig is still living and not dead, uh, as that would be an entirely different set of circumstances. I don't want to contemplate that. So, four works in all about Reagan. And believe it or not, I know he still has plans for as many as two, three, four more books on Reagan. Amazing. It is easy to see why Craig's books are essentially 
required reading for our hundreds of docents, volunteers who work here every day uh, to greet the thousands who come each year to learn about Ronald Reagan. But tonight, Craig is with us to talk about an entirely different subject than Ronald Reagan, albeit a subject fascinating to Craig as a historian, and I'm sure fascinating to all of you. His newest work, Mary Ball Washington, The Untold Story of George Washington's Mother, is, now that Harper Collins has wisely published it, a story well told. Now, you need not rely solely on my judgment in making that claim. After all, I'm simply an author myself, a struggling novelist of fantasy and fiction, jealous of Craig's success. But surely you would agree with Douglas Brinkley, the famed historian and editor of President Reagan's Diaries, who has proclaimed that Craig's newest book is, I quote, a magnificent biography of America's first mother and a major contribution to colonial and early republic leadership. Or you might agree with John Meacham, the Pulitzer Prize winning writer who has said that Craig's book is, quote, a surprising and important account of an essential figure long shrouded in the mist of time and legend. I wish that I could write like that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's get about our business and learn of the story of Mary Ball Washington firsthand from the best-selling author himself. Please join me in welcoming to the Reagan Library the talented, the one and only Craig Shirley. Thank you. Thank so, you. Please sit. Terrific to have you back here, Craig. Uh, I love coming here, anytime. Craig and I had um, the chance to have uh, lunch this afternoon and catch up. Um, it is always a pleasure to have him here. He really is, uh, you know, I, I, over the years I've learned a whole lot about Ronald Reagan and served in uh, Washington during the Reagan administration, but I still have questions to this day about certain things, and Craig's the world historian expert par excellence on President Reagan, so terrific to have you here. Well, thank you, thank you, John. It's an honor to be here. You know, we had lunch with someone else who I believe deserves the credit as the editor of your books, right? Now, who All might that be? That, uh, my long-suffering wife, Serene. <laughs> <laughs> Serene, please stand if you would. Serene's uh, great. Great to have you here, Serene. Um, she really does edit your work, right? Absolutely. And, and, uh, you, know, I'm, uh, you, know, you know, I've talked about this many times, is that in addition to writing books, I also uh, have collected stories about various uh, authors and how they went about their writing. You know, Hemingway, you know, for instance, down, down in uh, Key West, he had three different typewriters. And he'd get up in the morning, he'd, and he, owned, he never wrote more than like 500 words a day, but he would go over here and write one paragraph for whom the bell tolls, and he'd go over here and write one paragraph on the old man in the sea, and then one paragraph over here on the killers, and then he'd go fishing and drinking for the rest of the afternoon. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and and uh, Mark Twain did all of his best writing in, in Hartford, and he, it, he drew a chalk line across the floor uh, where he wrote, and nobody's allowed to cross that chalk line except for his wife, Olivia. O she was the only one, not, not the girls, not the maids, not, uh, not friends, nobody was allowed to cross that chalk line. And she would go over there and edit his works, take out all the obscene language that he put in the drafts and things like that. And so Zarin and I have had the same, you know, working chalk relationship. Line. Yes, <laughs> I, my, my writing den is my sanctum sanctorum, and nobody's allowed in there except for Zarin. And, and usually our routine is, is that, uh, my routine is, is every, every writer has their own, and you have talked about this, every writer has their own different routine, but usually, typically, is that I work doing the research in the morning, I write in the afternoon, and then along about, I write about for about four or five hours, and then Zareen takes the, the draft and edits it into the evening, and I go have, you know, several glasses of wine, <laughs> and, and then she, she gives me what she's edited, and then I input it the next morning, 
go back to the research, write four or five hours, and it's the same routine over and over and over. And it worked for us on nine books, so, and a bunch of op-eds, hundreds of op-eds, so. Neat, very neat, neat, neat. Yeah. Okay, so you've written 1941, you, all the Reagan books. What is it that got you to thinking about not writing directly about George Washington, the father of our country, but his mother? Well, I, my, my, probably my second favorite president is George Washington. Uh, because again, like Reagan, he's a fascinating figure of history and had many different careers, successful and otherwise. Um, but it seemed like the scholarship on Washington, although I, there's new Washington books coming out all the time, and to say that the scholarship on any man or woman is exhausted is that is always a mistake because as soon as you say that, then somebody finds some new fresh material that they, they come out with a, with, a, with a new look, way of looking at them. Chernow's book, Ron Chernow's book, Washington, which came out a couple of years ago, is a masterpiece. But I wanted to write about Washington, but I, the more I thought about it, and, and uh, it, it, Zreen and I talk about this a lot, was that uh, we realized this is that, is that nobody had ever done a definitive book on George Washington's mother. And she is arguably the most important uh, individual in the beginning of the American Revolution, the beginning of, of, of the breakaway from Great Britain, not because she had George, that's too easy, but how she raised George. And that everything that had gone on before, there was, there was one set of scholarship from the time of her passing away until the Civil War, she was depicted as uh, kind of either, either Mary, the mother of Christ, you know, kind of a June Cleaver type. But then after the Civil War, when the, when the realism period took over in American literature and you had Stephen Crane and the Red Badge of Courage and Moby Dick and Herman Melville and all this, is that she came across as a Joan Crawford character. <laughs> so, 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 and the more I looked into this and the more I researched this, and, and again, these were not books about her per se, they were simply citations in books about Washington that would depict her in, is, is either this one or the other individual. But the more we studied it, the more we got into it, the more we researched it, we realized that this was very unfair to her. And history has been very unfair to her. My experience, John, has been, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to be proven wrong on this, is, is, that, uh, is that good parents can sometimes produce a bad child. But I don't believe bad parents can, can produce a good child. Now. George's, President Washington's father was, was, by all accounts, a very good man. Augustine was a very good man. He was, very, he was tall, handsome, successful businessman, but he died when George was only 11 years old. So here's his mother, Mary, in her 30s, uh, in a century that's not very hospitable to women, raising six children all by herself. She's the quintessential single mother, and she does so successfully with all the children, but really successfully with George. And he's, so He's the oldest of the six. Yeah, he's the oldest of the, of the five. Of the, there were six, and then Mildred, the youngest, died in infancy, two and a half, I think, when she died. But even so, this is that this is a very arduous task for this woman, you know, who, who obviously can't, she can't vote, but legally can't even own property. Uh, the, the women of the era were not supposed to be able to own property. They were supposed to be their caretaker of, of their deceased husband's property and then pass it along to their eldest son. Uh, and, and so, but how does she raise, who uh, is arguably at the time, after the defeat of the, of the British, the greatest military uh, power in the world, the greatest military, the greatest navy, the greatest army, the greatest armaments, the greatest artillery in the world, the greatest leaders, military leaders, who had, had been successful in many European wars, you know, Cornwallis and Howe and all these other fellows, and that how does Washington, where does he get the, 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 the courage and the honor and the dignity and the tenacity, and where does he get all these superlative qualities that make him such a great man? Well, obviously, he got them from his mother. I mean, his brother Lawrence was the, his, his half-brother Lawrence from Augustine's first, first uh, marriage. George clearly looked up to his older half-brother. He was about 10 years older than him. He was, by all accounts, very successful. He was in the British Navy. He was successful. He was another good-looking, you know, tall product of Augustine uh, and his first wife, Jane. But he wasn't in Fredericksburg, 
very often. He wasn't at Ferry Farm very often. He wasn't at Westmoreland very often. And then he died uh, of, I think he died of dysentery at something like 31, 32 years of age. So, and, and George is still, you know, just a young teen. So, uh, so his influence on George's maturation was very, very abbreviated, as is George's father. So that deductive reasoning leads you to say, well, it was Mary. It was Mary who created George Washington. Okay, we'll, we'll get into her much more. Um, I noticed, I think in the book, it was perhaps an interview that you did, or I, you don't, you refuse to call the book a biography. Um, you, you say there's a certain amount of speculation. I think, yes. Right. And yes. Explain that. Writing this book, you know, when I write books about Washington, I wrote uh, wrote a, a book about Newt Gingrich, um, or not books about books about Reagan, or I write books about Newt Gingrich, or books about World War II, is that there were always a lot of people to talk to that I wanted to talk to that I wanted to gather information from. And there was a lot of reliable information. There were campaign documents, newspaper accounts, magazine accounts. But with Mary, a figure that you know died you know 250 years ago, and, and there, there's lots of holes. In her. It, it's like it's like it's like going out to the hobby store and buying a uh, a uh, puzzle, and a thousand piece puzzle, and bring it home and dump it on the table, and there's 300 pieces missing. And you got you just got to put this put the puzzle together with the pieces missing, and that's what this was about. Is is that is that we we searched high and low. I mean, we the George Washington the uh, the, the Mount Vernon uh, gave us access to letters and material that had not been easily accessible to other historians, and we got you know Fredericksburg and the Mary Ball Washington home and the library and the newspaper offices and Kenmore were. Her daughter Betty and, and uh, her son-in-law Fielding Lewis lived. They had some information, and uh, the Rising Sun Tavern had some information. Is there even a Mary Ball Washington Library? There, yeah, there is. Where is it? What's it's in Lancaster, where she was uh, her, her, spent her formative years, uh, right down the road from Epping Forest, where she was born. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as a matter of fact, that's kind of the reason why we did the book was because Zareen and I, uh, we sometimes attend um, the uh, White Chapel Episcopal Church, which was the ancestral church of the, Ball, the ancient Ball family. And it's the same church that she attended. Now, when she went there, it was Anglican, and then something unpleasant happened in 1776, and the Anglican church, you know, was kicked out of the United States because it was the Church of England, and then later became Episcopalian. Um, but uh, but but so all the Ball family records are still there at this church, so we had that to access as well. But for example, there's no portrait of no Mary Ball. No one has a clue really what she looked no, like. Nobody know, has one, a clue whatsoever, which is interesting because she was a woman of means. It was not, on, and of course, Stuart, you know, painted dozens of portraits of George Washington after. The Revolution. George Washington became a, a great hero in Europe. I mean, just unbelievable. And everybody, everyone in Europe wanted a portrait of George Washington. And Stewart did, I think, two, three portraits of Washington. And when he wasn't drunk, Stewart became a human Xerox machine, and he would just paint it over and over and over the same portrait of George Washington over and over and over, little 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 pictures, big pictures, and sell them. And so. Europe was littered with uh, with uh, with Stuart uh, pictures, uh, paintings of, of George Washington. Yeah, no portrait of her. Right? What does that tell you about I, the times or about her? I, that she well, she certainly you know was worthy of a portrait. Uh, she had the means to pay for a portrait, or George could have paid for one. There's only one, which is actually this one here, which is which is. One of those things of history where you say, okay, that's Mary Ball Washington, but this is not Mary Ball Washington. If you look closely, it looks like George Washington and drag. <laughs> uh, 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 but, uh, and this was painted 25 years after she passed away. And this was, uh, but, but everybody, all of her family said, they, they all were asked at the time or wrote letters at the time and said, not only is that not. Uh, Mary Ball Washington. She never sat for a for a painting. So, no. To answer your question, nobody knows what Mary looks like. Okay. Uh, 
give me your elevator speech on Mary Ball Washington. Now, 50 words or less. Define That's her. impossible. I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm asking the impossible. <laughs> Okay, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's, let's go talk to us about the world around her. What, uh, you know, what the sure. times that she lived in, what did her world look like? You know, uh, this is such a critical point. I refuse to commit the historical crime of, of presentism, which is judging people of 250 years ago based on the morals and standards that we live by today. It's, not, it's arrogant and it's unfair. Uh, I came across a recent word about, there was a, 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 a is there any help? It was, it, um, it was con contextualization. Contextualization, because I was reading a review of a book about the Civil War and about how people were judging what was happening in the Civil War and imposing their mores and standards and values on what happened 150 years ago. And, it's, and, it, it, it's, and they use this word, and I thought it perfectly summed it up, because is that you cannot understand the context, or if you do, it's unfair to judge the context. So, so she grows up in a world which is, is it, it is a white man's world, uh, especially if you are moneyed or propertied, or if you are of aristocracy, even in the United States, although it's less important here than, say, in Great Britain or, or France or something like that. Uh, uh, it's, um, it, it, you know, the idea that most people didn't travel more than 50 miles from where they were born. Their, their whole lives. Their whole lives mm -hmm. is that, and there's no evidence that Mary traveled more than 50, you know, because Westmoreland County where she raised George and Essex, uh, Lancaster County where she was born and Fredericksburg where she lived all, virtually all of her life, is all within 35, 40 miles of each other. There's one story that may be true that she went to Mount Vernon once to ask him not to go into the French and Indian Wars, but that is only 50 miles from Fredericksburg to Mount Vernon. And then there's one story is that she was evacuated from, uh, from Fredericksburg when there was a rumored British invasion of Fredericksburg and that she went west into western Pennsylvania, which is, but. There's, but there's no information on how far she went, she went, but it's doubtful she went all that very far. So everybody, most everybody in that world is living in within the same 50 mile radius that they were born and they're gonna die in. Is that, you know, is that people, you know, it was unusual for people to live in their 50s. They died of dysentery, they died of, they died of smallpox, they died of influenza, they died of ch child infant mortality was through the roof. You know, this is why they had so many children because, you know, and this is where, part of the reason why she's so unusual is because all si five of her six children grow into adulthood and five or six children live into their 60s or, or later. Uh, Betty lives into her, uh, I think her 80s and of course Mary herself lived into her 80s. Uh, but of course, you know, her husband died of an early age. Lauren, her, her uh, stepson, uh, uh, George's half brother, dies of a uh, uh, at an early age. So, so death is all around you all the time. So is slavery, and so is slavery. She had slaves. Uh, it was it was a part of culture. It was a part of society. Uh, it, I don't think that they, they ever really thought about is this right or wrong. That you know, that just wasn't something within her can or within her society. I mean, obviously Washington thought about it because he did free all the slaves on his deathbed. I mean, that was part of his directive. So he at least thought about it, and they thought about it at, in Philadelphia when they're, when, at the Constitutional Convention. I mean, they did debate it. So some people were thinking about it, but, they, but it was more of an, in an abstract sense, but in a real sense, uh, she had, she owned Ferry Farm and she had 20 slaves there. It's like property, right? Property. Yes, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I read in your book that uh, when she passed away in her last will and testament, she willed slaves to That's George, exactly right. to others in the family, yeah. etc. You know, it's common yeah, practice. This slave, yeah, it's common. This slave went to Charles, this slave went to Betty, this, you know, I don't think she left any slaves to George, but. Uh, but she did to her, to her other children. Uh, and she lived on a farm that yes. did? Ferry farm. Yeah, there were two farms and one was, one was Ferry Farm. That was, the, that was the one that was a source of great argument between her and George for 20 years because 
his father, Augustine, in his will had left Ferry Farm to George. And of course, you know, is that George is a child when his father passed away, so he can't get possession of it. And then when it's time for him to get possession of it, she's not gonna, she doesn't give it to him. And this becomes a fight between the two of them for 20, 30, 40 years. And, you know, I want my property, mother. And she said, oh, I'll give it to you when I feel like, you know, I want my property, mother. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, something else. Um, George Washington, I think I recall, was somewhat important to the American Revolution. Um, but his mother opposed it, right? Yes. Well, yes and no. Again, this is one of those things about contextualization is, is that Mary grows up in a British world, is that is the United States of America did not exist. We were the colonies, we were British subjects, we, she, she was a regular, regular congregant in the Anglican Church, the Church of England. She followed British fashion. She read of British events and British wars. Uh, she used British coinage or money. Uh, in every shape or form is that she is a, she believes in the divine right of King George II and the divine right of King George III in every way from the time she's born up until 1776 is that she is a British subject. Uh, and, and even afterward is that, it, you know, because you take any of us is that if, you, if, you, if we're in a certain society and culture and setting and then we're told 50, after we've been immersed in this, we've been marinated in this lifestyle for 50 years, and then we're told everything you learned for the first 50 years of your life is wrong. And now you have to believe that King George II is no longer your king, is that you're not a British subject. You, the, 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 the British Empire is not important to you anymore. The indiv you are important to yourself. The individual is important to yourself. Is that, is that the church is no longer, you're, you're free to worship in any church you want to worship. You don't have to worship in the Anglican church. It, uh, it, it, and, and by the way, if you want to boo the king, you can boo the king without being, you know, you know, being put in the Tower of London or something else like that. It's that you have all these freedoms and you have a new way of looking at the world because everything you learn for the first 50 years of your life is wrong. And, and some people went along with that and some people didn't, is that historians will tell you is that during the time of the American Revolution, maybe as, time, maybe as many as 30, 40 percent of the colonists were actually Tory sympathizers, were, were opposed to Washington and the Revolution and, and, and Philadelphia. Uh, is that even Benjamin Franklin's own son was imprisoned as a Tory spy. Uh, so, it, it, so Tory sympathizers were widespread throughout the colonies, and she was, I would say she was a sympathizer, she was, uh, she was uh, like a conscientious objector is what she was. <laughs> she was agnostic. Yeah. Even as her, as her son is leading the American Revolution. So we'll get to the point where he enters the American Revolution, but prior to that time, uh, I think I read that you wrote that George Washington had, had an interest in deciding and he wanted to actually go into the British Navy. Yes. And uh, his mother opposed it. Right? Yes. Uh, he, when he was 14 years old, he wanted to join the British Navy as a cabin boy. Now this was at a time and Mary didn't know it, but the Admiralty kept very good logs and records, the British Admiralty did. One third of, Brit of Br cabin boys on board British warships died at sea. They died in battle, they died of scurvy, they died of, you know, disease, and they were also in the, with, these, with these crews that were, they were nothing but drunks and murderers. The, the, you know, these impressed gangs used to go through the, the bars and brothels of London and just grab these guys, just grab these, these derelicts and, and throw them onto their British ships and said, you're now working for the British crown. And, so, and th these were not, you know, these were not model citizens, right? I mean, these were not, you know, this was not, be you know, Beaver and, uh, and Wally in the gang. You and know? she didn't want her son to be any part of that. Yeah, well, right? it, but you put a 14-year-old boy into that setting and, and something bad's gonna happen. So. She's not really aware of, but her inst but I think her more instinct was self. She wanted George to be home, to for her needs. Right. So, but she writes a letter to her brother John in London and asked asks his advice about what do you think about George going into the British Navy as a cabin boy, and with this hot letter comes back from John. It says, under no circumstances 
do you let George become a, a cabin boy in the British Navy? And he used the word dog. He said, you'll be treated like a dog. And he used it in other pejorative, which I won't say, but it, it, it was in this letter. Uh, and there was a caste system in the British Navy, as you can imagine, because it was, it was royal society. Uh, and, and, and cabin boys, like the officers and crew, is that first in line were, uh, were British subjects, or uh, British royalty, British no nobility. Then the second were British subjects, and then after that would be French and Spanish, and then Canadian, whatever. But way down at the, at the bottom of the list, after Jamaican slaves were Americans. They were at the bottom, bottom rung. And so this was the letter that she gets back from her brother explaining to her, you know, how bad things would be for George if he joined the British Navy. So, so uh, she forbid him, and he, he acceded to her wishes. So he gives up on that, but he later that. he uh, tells her, I, well, guess what now? I'm, I'm joining the British Army to yes. help fight the French and yes. the Indians, right? Yes. Uh, I, yes. I kind of wonder what you, you know, <laughs> how you might forecast if she had gotten her way there. Because had he not... Well, he was medicine. older. He was older, and he was infused with the spirit of adventure. He went to the Ohio, Ohio Valley three times uh, to fight in the French and Indian Wars. He went once as a, as, a, uh, as a lieutenant colonel in the Virginia militia, and then the next two times he went was as a, as a regular, as an officer in the British Army. Mm. And he loved the adventure. He thought it was wonderful. He wrote a letter to his brother, John, saying there's something romantic about the, sci about the world, the whiz of bullets as they speed past your ears, you know? <laughs> he, 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 even when he was captured as a prisoner of war. Well, this was his tra training. It was that, right out the doors. It was, yeah. But this, in ever, this was stepping stone, this experience yes. in the British Army is what uh, <coughs> made him qualified. Absolutely. Right, to Which is in part why he was chosen to be the commander of the Continental Army, chosen unanimously to be the commander of the United, Continental Army. Uh, you know, the, I think, I'm not sure if you, I read this into what you were saying in the book. I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I got the sense what you were saying, Craig, about George Washington and his capabilities, his independence, his stubbornness, uh, um, that um, he inherited that from his mother in the sense of she was often stubborn as heck. Yes. And, and, you know, she tried to pull him in. He wanted to pull away. It was essentially the independence that he needed to get from her in order to be George Washington and fight for independence for the country. I, that... I believe that. Yes, I do. Yeah, I think that uh, the, in a way is, is that as much as she infused him with all these wonderful, great qualities of faith and freedom and courage and dignity and honor and all those other wonderful adjectives. It was also the desire to break away from her. So he needed to get his independence before he, then he could lead the war for independence. He, yeah. had get, he had to get his independence from her. But he was never completely free from her. He, she was always on his mind. Uh, he was the executive of her estate. Uh, is that he was dutiful about, you know, she was writing letters and say, I need money, I need money, I need money. Once when he was in the French and Indian War, she, she actually wrote him a letter, which she got, you know, in the Ohio Valley. It took, you know, months for it to get there, but she wrote him a letter said she needed a pound of butter and a new slave. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he writes a letter back saying, Mother, we don't have butter here, you know? <laughs> I can't, I'm a little bit preoccupied right now. I can't deal with these things right now. I was wondering if you would define the father of our country, George Washington, as a good son. Was he a good son? Oh, yes, yes, very. He, he, uh, he I won't say he was conflicted, uh, but he was a very dutiful son, he did bring her allowance, he did look after her affairs, he did manage her, you know, he was the executive of her estate and, and, and take care of that, even at the time when he was, you know, becoming president of the United States and trying to put together the national government and dealing with the, the, the affairs in New York and dealing with his own affairs, you know, the problems at Mount Vernon. I mean, he's got a lot going on in his life, you know? And, uh, but he was a dutiful son and even, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I want to talk about the last time they meet. No, go. Uh, um, is that uh, I think that 
He was, he was like all of us, is that we're on a long and often fruitless quest to get our mother's approval. <laughs> uh, and, 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 but he did the last time they met. Before he goes to New York, he's won the revolution. The Articles of Confederation fail. The Second Continental Congress reorganizes, creates the United States Constitution. He's unanimously elected President of the United States. He's going to New York to assemble the new government. But before he goes, he makes one last trip to Fredericksburg to take her, her allowance and to see her, check in on her. Now, she's in her 80s. She's dying of breast cancer. He knows she's dying of breast cancer. He knows that this is going to be the last time he probably ever sees her because he's going to go to New York and be there for a protracted period of time. And by two contemporaneous, contemporaneous accounts, it was a very, very tender, sweet, bittersweet, loving, last embrace in which she basically said finally is that I approve of you as a son. I approve of what you've done with your life. You, 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 you're, you're a magnificent man. You've made me proud. You know, basically, he, he, he won the final victory for his mother's approval. Um, and, and interestingly enough is that when he offered her the allowance that he brought to her, she said, no, I don't need to have enough money. So he didn't end up leaving that. But when he went to New York, uh, he, took his, uh, he took his nephew, who was the son of, um, of uh, Fielding and uh, Betty Lewis, as his aide. And when he was told in New York that his mother had passed away, he went into a room and it was there for, for an extended period of time, maybe three or four hours, by himself, obviously dealing w with his grief as best he could about the passing of his mother. So it, it, th there was a formality, there was a stiffness, even in the letter, you know, because he always addressed letters to his mother as honored madam. Uh, and I think that was indicative of two things. It was indicative of, of one, his respect for her, but it was also indicative of a kind of an arm's length relationship. It wasn't mommy or mommy dearest or my loving mother or my dear mother or whatever. It was honored madam. Yeah. Uh, Stiff and correct and formal. So I, I know she was not there for when he took the oath of office, this inauguration. Did she actually survive? Um, to that moment, had, yes. had he become president yes. of the United States? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, she did. And yeah. she had a knowledge of that? Yeah, well, I, I believe so, yes. You know, is, the, again, it's one of those things where is, is that there's a piece of the puzzle, but you, everybody in America knew that George Washington had become president. Uh, and so, and so, you know, every, the newspapers would have, you know, neighborhoods, neighbors would have told her or informed her or a doctor or something else like that. And she knew he was going to New York to become the first president of the United States. So, and it was only several weeks after that, you know, March of 1887, that he becomes, 1889, uh, becomes the first president of the United States. Yeah, proud mother, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, I would like to uh, have uh, our audience, if you've got any questions at all, I don't, I don't know if any of you have already had a chance to read Craig's book. Uh, it's a wonderful read. If you like history, uh, and it's, it's certainly obviously a book about Mary Ball Washington, but it's a, a book about American history and a critical time for our nation and a book about the, the father of our country. So it's just fascinating. It's really worth. So I hope that um, uh, if you can, you stick around and uh, Craig would be happy to sign your book and, and uh, for, talk with you. But, yeah, please, if you have any, <laughs> if you have any, uh, we have a question right here. Maybe you could bring the microphone over. Just that's all I ask is that if you got a question, raise your hand and we'll put a microphone in front of you so that everyone can hear uh, your question. We'll start here. This may or may not apply, but I was wondering if she had a relationship with Martha Washington and what was that like? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the, uh, well, I, but... yeah. I, I try to address that in the book, and that's a great question. Um, is uh, it, 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 there's very little evidence of their interacting whatsoever. Uh, this, this, there was one time when um, George and Martha were at uh, Mount Vernon. It was after the Revolution, and, and, uh, but before he's becoming president. It's during the Articles of Confederation. He writes a letter to his mother-in-law, Mrs. Dandridge, and he says, please come and visit us. We have lots of food. 
We have lots of visitors, we have lots of room, and we have wonderful music. So please come and visit us. And along about the same time, he writes a letter to, to Mary saying, don't come and visit. You won't like the food. There's too many people here. Uh, the, you, the, there's not enough room, and the music's too loud. So, so, um, but uh, the, the, all we can go on is circumstantial evidence. Like, for instance, when George and Martha get married at, interestingly enough, the White House, but not the White House. Martha inherits the estate from her husband, Danbridge, and he had a, a big palatial estate in Western Virginia that was called the White House. And that's where George and Martha were married. But Mary doesn't go to that. Mary never visits them in Mount Vernon. And when George and Martha go to Fredericksburg together, is that Martha doesn't go to Mary's house with George, to accompany her George. She goes and stays at friends or relatives' houses. She doesn't go see her mother-in-law. Um, there's no, but there's no written, uh, there's no letters between the two or, you know, you know, you nasty old bag, you know, you <laughs> leave my son alone. I mean, there's nothing like, <laughs> you know, or, you know, you know, or a letter from Martha, from Mary to Martha saying, you know, that's not the color lipstick my son likes, you know, or, <laughs> <laughs> right. the, 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 so there's nothing like that. But, but it, so it, to the extent that they interacted, I suspect it was correct and formal, but, but Mary, but Mary was, was correct and formal with everybody. She was not uh, by any account, a very, you know, a very tender, loving person. So, that is, because I, I, we really, really dug, dug, dug down on that through letters and, and, and articles and, uh, and, and book, new, you know, book accounts, and, and history is really pretty silent on the relationship between Martha and Mary, so. I wonder if, it, if perhaps the absence of anything says, says something. I, that's what I think, mm -hmm. that's what I think. Uh, is, is that because there is no, there's nothing there, then, then there probably was a strained, I think it's probably an educated guess to say there was a strained relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it kind of makes sense because Mary was very possessive of George. She was very possessive of George, and so it kind of stands to reason, you know, it, we've no all had woman is good mother in laws, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Understood. Over here, I think. Yes. Thank you. I was just curious, why do you think George never had any children? That's a very easy question. Uh, he had mumps as a, a teenager, and mumps often make a man sterile. Uh, and so uh, he, never, he never produced any offspring. He had two children that were um, from, from Martha's uh, previous marriage, Jackie and Patsy, and they became his, his stepchildren, but both of them died of smallpox at, in their late teens, Jackie and Patsy. One was boy, one was girl. They both died of smallpox in their uh, in their late teens. But but Washington had mumps. Mm. Uh, yes, over here. Um, I know Mary was born here in the Americas, but when did her family, the Ball family, come over, and did she have siblings, and how did she get on with them, if there's any records of that? Yeah. Uh, her, her upbringing is very, very complicated. Uh, her great-grandfather came to the United States, settled in, in the Millenbeck area of the Northern Neck, and, but by the time she was 11, by the time Mary was 11, she lost a mother, a father, a stepfather, and a sister, and she went to live with a, a gentleman named George Eskridge, who became kind of a surrogate father to her, and she adored George Eskridge so much so that she named her first son George, after George Eskridge. Uh, but again, the information on her relationship with her, with, her, with her siblings, to the extent that there's any information, is very, very, is very, very thin. It's, um, you know, the other thing too is, is that just to give you, just so you understand is, is that there's, in some areas there's plenty of information, and in other areas there's no information, or history is silent, or, is, or there's specious information, is that we don't know where Mary Ball Washington is buried. Hmm. She is buried somewhere in Fredericksburg, but, but we don't know where she was buried. Uh, and, and we don't know when she was born. 
We know approximately when she was born, but it was never recorded in the family Bible. So she was born, we think she was, you know, in her mid to early 80s when she passed away. We know, we know when she died. And we know she existed. We know how she lived. We know she lived in Fredericksburg. We know, you know, th certain things through letters and, and contemporaneous letters and things like that. But, uh, but on the other hand, there are great, you know, gaps uh, of knowledge about her, too. Yes, over here, sir. I, I had read that uh, uh, President Washington had read uh, or mastered some 100, 150 rules of propriety and politeness, and I wonder to what extent uh, uh, he uh, got that from the influence of his mother. Uh, that's a great question. My Zerini's grinning over here. I forgot to bring it with me. Is that, th yes, you're exactly right. And he wrote it down, uh, and it was, it was, some of it's very funny. It's like, you know, don't put your hands on certain parts of your body in public, you know. So it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know I mean, other things like that. Uh, and where he got it from, actually, is George Washington's Rules of Behavior, which they sell at Mount Vernon you know, and things like that. But actually, he got it from, it was put down on paper by Franciscan monks in France a century before. But he rewrote it to improve his penmanship uh, as much as anything, because he, was, he, he had two tutors as a child, but also he, there was a lot of kind of self-teaching at home or homeschooling or whatever. Uh, so, but, but, so yes, he did, he did write this down. He, did, and he, and he, I don't know if she, she made him write it. There's no evidence about that. But he was an extremely disciplined man. You have to look at his records that he kept at Mount Vernon. He was very scrupulous about you know, his, his property, his possessions, his acreage, how his cousin Lund was managing Mount Vernon, who was very distressed about Lund's management of Mount Vernon when he was gone fighting the revolution. Uh, but acreage, horses, uh, the building, the property, he was very, you know, his possessions, everything. He was very, very scrupulous about keeping uh, meticulous records. Uh, over, right over here, here, we've got someone bringing you in a mic right here. Are there any living descendants from siblings or nieces and nephews? No, there are no living direct descendants from, from Washington. There are from his brothers, from Charles and John, there are uh, descendants uh, uh, today. But it's not like, uh, I don't know if you know this, is that, but uh, and I just find this fascinating. John Tyler, who was our 14th president of the United States, uh, had children into his 80s, who then had children, who had son, who had children in his 80s. John Tyler's grandson lives near where we live in, in, uh, in Virginia. We live in a little town, Dunsville, Virginia, on the, north, on the Middle Peninsula. So John Tyler was president of the United States in the 1840s. His grandson <laughs> is alive and lives in the family homestead, the Tyler family homestead there on the Pamunkey River. So, isn't that fascinating? <laughs> amazing, amazing. Uh, yes, uh, I think there's a question right over here. Hi. When do you get to uh, understand if his mom came on board with the revolution? You talked about her being so British-minded. When did she come on board as far as being a, a revolutionary? Yeah, that's, I don't know if there was any one there was an epiphany so much as just an acceptance. Uh, there was one time where she was working in her garden and a, and a messenger came up breathlessly to, you know, town crier basically, to, to inform her, the mother of the general leading the, that George has just won an important battle and she's working in her garden and she basically said, well, that's what George is supposed to do. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, but, but, but after the revolution, is that, and we, and we have a copy of the newspaper announcement about this, there was a big celebration in Fredericksburg with you know, speeches and punch and cake and dancing and music and all this to honor General Washington and to honor his mother. The, the, the honor was, the, the dinner was to, to honor both George and Mary Ball Washington. So, and, and she was there uh, and, uh, and apparently she was also like George, a very good dancer. Uh, she was also a very good horsewoman like George, too, which explains his 
his, his, you know, because he was very good on a horse and he was a very good dancer and, you know, where did he learn that from? He learned that from her, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Neat. Other, yes, right here. How long did it take you research-wise to complete this book? Four years. <laughs> four years. And that usually takes me, for all my books, it usually takes four years to go through everything you know, that I can find every scrap of material, every, you know, every letter, every, you know, uh, book, every newspaper account, you know, just keep tracking, tracking, tracking down. And then sometimes you find a new lead, like we found some interesting information at the, the office of um, the Sons of the American Revolution. It, they have a national office in Washington, D.C. We found some interesting information there. So you know, is that the process of research which is 99% done in a library anyway, is often you will go through material and then you read something and then all of a sudden another door opens up or a window opens up and then you pursue a completely new avenue of an individual. You say, oh, I didn't know that about that person. I got to talk to that person. I got to call that person. Uh, and, and that's happened with all my Reagan books, you know, where it, you know, because I interviewed President Carter, I interviewed Vice President Mondale, I interviewed everybody with, with the Reagan campaign. And oftentimes you talk to somebody and they will tell you something that's a revelation to you and all of a sudden that just opens up a whole different avenue. I mean, there's nobody to talk to about Mary Ball Washington who was alive at the time, but there were plenty of historians and custodians and, and uh, people who were uh, docents at libraries, things like that, who would pass along new information, you know, that then would open up, you know, so, but, to answer your long answer for a good short question, but yeah, it, used to, it took me four years. Four years to uh, research and write. Yes. To complete yes. it. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. I, I do the, I, I, I probably do it wrong, but I write as I research and then I go back and, and write again if, if, if the research is, doesn't support the data of the writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had the chance to uh, visit with Craig in his offices in Alexandria, and I know that's probably just one place where you keep a phenomenal number of records. I don't know uh, how this room might be filled with the boxes that you have. It's really remarkable. Actually, <laughs> we, when we go back to Virginia, uh, Zareen's car is in the driveway, and in the, in the car are six boxes of new books <laughs> that, that I have to unload for my new book on 1945. Yeah. And there's also all this new fresh data. I'm doing a book. I did a book called December 1941, 31 Great Days book. to Change America and Save the World. And, and uh, it was a New York Times bestseller, I'll tell you modestly. Uh, but it was about the radical changes that went on in the United States in those 31 days from December 1st to December 31st. And, I, and if you, uh, America changes in un ways you cannot imagine in just 31, just one month. So I'm writing a companion book to that just on 1945. The entire year. The entire year, year because yeah. the whole year is utterly, every year, every day is momentous. You know, FDR dies, Truman becomes president, Hitler commits suicide, Stalin takes Moscow, the, the VJ Day, VE Day, Winston Churchill's voted out of office three weeks after leading the Great Britain in the greatest struggle in the history of the British Empire. In the history, the thousand year empire, he wins the greatest struggle of, of the of, in a thousand years. And, and three, within three weeks, the British people vote him out of office. Mm. I mean, it's just like, it's like, what have you done for me lately, Winston? <laughs> you know? uh, uh, we, we dropped the atomic bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The, uh, the, uh, Franklin Roosevelt dies. Um, the United Nations is created. The GI Bill, uh, the Marshall Plan. It's just an astonishingly packed year of, of history, just on a, on a daily basis. You know, and just interesting little things, too, like, FDR in January of 45 takes over Montgomery Ward department store, the whole chain. He just takes it over by government fiat and actually the, 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 he sends in the U.S. Army to arrest Montgomery Ward executives because he doesn't like their labor policies and he doesn't like their wage policies. And he just takes over the department store. And, and, and the department store, they go to court and they lose and the, the executives go to court. It's just. But it's just a matter of course, and that's just one little thing that happens in 1945, which is nationalizing a department store because you didn't like their management. I wonder policies. what Mary Ball Washington would think of that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> We're almost, we've got just a couple minutes left. We'll take this question right here in the back. Yeah, I'm just wondering in those four years of all that research, is there anything that was uniquely shocking or scandalous or, you know, super, uh, super revelation about Mary that made you feel like, aha, this is who she was? I don't think it was. I don't think it was any one thing. I think it was a series of things, and 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 I've thought about this a lot. Um, is as I said before, I said history has been very unkind to her, and I guess that's the real point of the book is is that she was a far more consequential woman. She was a far more complicated woman. She was a far more decent woman. She was a far more honorable woman. Even Chernow. In his new book, Washington, he wrote that she was an unlettered countrywoman. Well, but that's not true, because she did write letters. And, and, and considering the fact that she was a woman in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the 1700s, when women didn't go to school, but the fact that she could read and write was itself an advancement for her, and she did write frequently, uh, and she wasn't a, a bumpkin, she was a, a sophisticated city woman who lived in Fredericksburg, which was a major hub of commerce at the time. Uh, so th there wasn't any one thing about it. It was, it was, it was just the, the dawning uh, of, of, to me and to Zareen, as we're reading this material and going through this material, is just that we needed, we wanted to do this to give Mary her due uh, in the context of American history is that she was a good woman, she was a complicated woman, she was an intense woman, she was a fearsome woman, but she was, she was a tough woman. But all these things she had to be because it was a tough century, because it was a tough time, especially for a single mother, you know, a single mother raising six children in, 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 her, in, her, 19, in her 30s. Uh, she was tough because the times, because she had to be tough. And I think, imagine, is that if she wasn't tough, would we have had George Washington? And if we didn't have George Washington, who was the essential man, he was the only one who could lead the American Revolution. He was the only one. He was chosen unanimously to, as the commander-in-chief. He was chosen unanimously to preside over the Constitutional Convention. He was unanimously chosen President of the United States and then unanimously re-elected President of the United States. So I mean, he's there, there's there's a there's a group of opinion, and I think it, many historians will tell you today. He, you know, I'm often asked about the greatest presidents, and and I will always say that Washington was our greatest because I think being the first is the toughest. Starting something is the toughest. Winning a a, a major war against an international superpower, which is what the British were. And the genius of, of him holding the war together for seven years, and really is that part of his genius was just avoiding disaster by moving his troops from one location to another, staying one step ahead of the British, and then striking, you know, like at Trenton, you know, when, when opportunities, you know, opportunity uh, availed itself, or, or at Yorktown where opportunity availed itself. Uh, is, is that just holding it together for seven years was part of his genius. But all these qualities, all these uh, things that we admire today, they had to come from somewhere. And so, and, and as I said before, I, I don't think a bad parent can produce a, a good child. So, so, and if you believe that George Washington was a good man, which I think everybody here believes that, is that it stands to reason that Mary also was a good person. I think that's a, a wonderful way to end it, um, uh, Craig. We are just so delighted that you could join us this evening. And thank you so oh, much. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.